Welcome to EPG Patshala. I am Swati Biswas from the Department of Islamic History and Culture, University of Calcutta. Today we are going to discuss from the paper Economic History of India from earliest to 1707 AD, the module Early European Trade and Commerce. In this module, we are going to basically understand the nature of the early European trade the changes that ushered in the subcontinent because of the advent of the Europeans, the reaction of the Indian traders with their advent and the reaction of the rulers to this trade. Now let us introduce you to this module. The advent of the Europeans in the trade and commerce of Indian Ocean brought about a change in the traditional pattern that existed. The sea route became the competitive for Indian mar merchants and the use of arms and trade it was a new phenomenon which was started by the Portuguese and it was continued by the English, Dutch and the French. The Indian state was not effective enough to combat the monopolizing trade of the Europeans and ultimately the balance of trade and commerce moved in the favor of the Europeans. Now, let us first look into the Portuguese domination in the Indian Ocean. The advent of the Portuguese in the Indian Ocean had immense significance. The first step was taken by Vasco da Gama in 1497, where he landed in the port of Calicut and stayed there for two years. He went back reported to King Manuel in his letter to the Cardinal of the Vatican where he mentioned about the political and economic significance of the voyage of Africa and also India and the Indian spices. Well, this was the turning point in the Portuguese domination of the Indian Ocean. Now, the Portuguese from the very start were very focused traders with very aggressive mood. The traditional rivalry of the trade over, uh, over trade and religion among the Muslims and Christians surfaced with the advent of the Portuguese. And the Portuguese used every opportunity to refer to this issue for their own convenience. Now, the India, especially the southern coast, was flocked from a, by all kinds of merchants from Arabia and West Asia and mostly were Muslim merchants. The Portuguese had a greater plan of monopoly which the other merchants lacked. That the concept of monopoly trade was brought into the Indian Ocean by the Portuguese. Moreover, their mission was supported by the government and therefore that game uh, gave them a kind of unity which or a vision which was not there among other merchants. Other merchants operated as individuals and they did not uh, anyhow represent any country or nation for that matter. In the 16th century, the Portuguese changed their plan. Now they instead of only targeting the Muslim ships, target between Red Sea, of course, and the western coasts of India, they tried to control the trade uh, and the spice trade, especially on a monopolistic uh, whole. Now, they had two advantages. The first advantage was the naval superiority over the Asian ships. Secondly, the establishment of a key outpost on land which were very strategic for naval fleet and for men left in charge of the trading operations which the other merchants did not have. The mission of frontal attack Appear first happened in 1502. The Portuguese, after being ensured uh, by the king of Calicut, the Zamorins, that they were in a no mood to oust the Muslims or Muslim traders by bombarded Calicut. Interesting that the Raja of Cochin was a rival of the Zamorins and that made the Portuguese comfortable from the very start. So we have to keep in mind, always keep track of the indigenous rivalries and always tried to manipulate that. So it started first with the 
uh, rivalry of the rulers of Calicut and the rulers of Cochin. He allowed them, rather the Raja of Cochin, allowed them to construct the fort, of Ma uh, a fort in the Malabar coast very close to the Calicut in 1503. The second gain was the control of the island of Goa in 1510 from the rulers of Bijapur led by Alfonso de Albuquerque. In 1509, under the governorship of Francis de Almeida, the Portuguese tried to control Diu, but this was in vain. The mission of making Goa the, uh, the seat of Portuguese power was all the more established in 1511 when they were able to control Malacca. Malacca was a key place from which the sea route with Far East Asia could be controlled. Malacca itself was an important commercial center. Added to this success with the control of Ormuz in the Persian Gulf in 1515 and their mission of controlling the Red Sea up to the Western Ghats was com almost complete. The South Umedo Malipur on the coast of Coromandel, Chittagong in Bengal, Macau in the estuary of the Pearl River in China and Colombo in Ceylon, Ceylon was all controlled by the Copt Portuguese by this time and we have to understand that this whole area was being controlled by the Portuguese who had better ships and better arms and munitions. The maritime empire that acquired uh, the name under uh, the Portuguese was called the Estuda uh, India and this concept of a monopoly trade controlled by a state uh, was a something of a very new uh, ideologically to the trading community of the Asia and also to the rulers because it was very difficult for them to emphasize that a group of traders were being controlled by uh, the nation or a ruler which was about thousand miles away and in a different continent altogether. The long distance trade in the Indian context was always encouraged by the rulers because of only one reason, because it added to the tax system that they could levy. The merchants counted the cost of that tax in the prices. The interregional security was also ensured through certain payments and this was known as the redistributive enterprise. The rulers levied these taxes and enjoyed the revenue for a long time without any greater vision into the trade. The Portuguese on the other hand introduced a relatively new concept of claim to control exclusivity of the sea route. The weakness of the naval power of the Asian rulers let the Portuguese control the redistributive enterprise. So the power of the indigenous rulers moved into now the hand of the Portuguese traders. There are two aspects of this sale of protection. The tribute was demanded from the Asian traders and their ships and this happened in the form of Carthay system. So this concept of tribute was, came to be known as the Carthay system which had a papal sanction or the sanction of the post. But of course this concept of a sanction had no importance to the traders of India but it had a greater ac acceptance among the Portuguese traders. Secondly, the Portuguese allowed their direct trade with Europe to be influenced by the cost of obtaining protection over the overland caravan route. The Indian ships abided by the Karte system, so much so the rulers of Bijapur and the Mughals also obtained this, their permission through the Karte system. So in a way, the rulers also had to bow down uh, when it came to sea trade before the Portuguese. The redistributive enterprise was a key to Portuguese economic prosperity and the Estoda India was wholly a pirate based system and a very parasitic venture. So it all depended not on any rule or regulation but the might of the 
Portuguese armed system. It grew on a ruthless plunder of the unarmed Asian merchant ships, but of course it did not go unchallenged. Their own officials at times were corrupt and their administrative laxity was a challenge by themselves, but it was also faced by uh, challenges from the rest of the nations in Europe soon. They understood the problem and as a result, the crown profits were fixed by protection costs on the caravans. But this was too limited an issue to control the problem. In the 17th century, the heir of the Portuguese monopoly in the spice trade was given to a company called the United East India Company of the Netherlands. The company was determined to establish and defend with the real strength and exclusive trade in finer spices and paper. They faced a stiff competition from East India Company. In the last decade of the 16th century, the Dutch and the English both began to organize exploratory voyages to the Indies. Now, let's look into how the Dutch entered this scenario. The English East India Company was born in 1600 and the various Dutch enterprises merged into Verenier Ost in the Champagne of VOC in 1602. The establishment of their relation with the commercial center of India was very complex though. Initially, they were busy in the Indonesian archipelago and the spice islands from the Portuguese were becoming very weak. The Dutch with their lighter vessels were more effective in the sea and they posed a threat and a stiff competition to the Portuguese. The Indian frame of, framework of course was the reality which both the powers had to deal. It was difficult to trade profitably in the eastern per, uh, archipelago in paper, pepper and spices without the aid of the cotton textiles of India. Now this is something very interesting to note. The economy of many islands in the area was imperfectly monetized during this period. That is, there was not much of money moving in circulation. The clothing material supplied by the Indian handloom weavers provided an essential barter community. So instead, uh, uh, there was a kind of a barter system of the Indian cotton textile and the spices of the East Indies. The cost of uh, Coromantal and Gujarat plain in Western India produced variety of pat pattern cotton fabrics which had a popular market in Southeast Asia. Indonesia had an interesting exchange trade with India for a long time. The Dutch and the English trade in the 17th century from Maslipatnam and Surat rested on this interchangeable Asian trade of the time. So they were clever enough compared to the Portuguese to get hold of this barter system which was a traditional practice of both the areas. There was now a possibility that the items would find a market in the Europe uh, leading to a new kind of trade relations. So a relation which only happened between India and the East Indies or, or, so, or for that matter Indonesian islands would now take a turn towards European market. The Dutch replaced and took over the inter-Asian trade previously carried on by the Portuguese. The English East India Company also attempted to intervene in the country trade but in vain and the Dutch success was remarkable at this stage. Both the English and the Dutch companies seriously took the trade with Europe and gave it much importance unlike the Portuguese. Their presence in the Asian trade incorporated a much better economic and mercantile spirit than was in the case of the Portuguese. The political philosophy of both the companies and their act was to strengthen and recreate the old monopolistic share in the Asian trade. The secure special fiscal privileges thereby reducing the burden of redistributive enterprises. One of the documents of 1605 
says that emphasis was ne needed to monopolize the trade on clove, nutmeg and maize. The document also insisted on a direct relation immediately with the coast of Coromandel because of the cloth trade. So therefore we have to understand this whole trade was being controlled by the European on based on two important commodities. One is the cotton cloths or the cotton textile of India and the other is the spices of Asia. So it, it moved, it diversified into other commodities but not at this time. Gujarat was obviously another region uh, which had to be controlled by the European powers. In 1606, the Dutch obtained the right to establish a factory in Maslipatnam from the king of Golconda and granted a much, much less, lesser duty rate. Thus, they established themselves well between the delta of Krishna and Godavari in South India and we have to understand that this whole area was popular for its textile manufacturing. This region was also uh, famous for a kind of weaving and painting of the fine shins which was exported to Bantam, Achin, Malacca and Manila. The Dutch later realized that chins was much cheaper down south and easier to trade as the rulers of Vijayanagar was much mild compared to the rulers of Golconda. So we have to understand that the in this case, the Dutch or the Europeans at large were always there into the look where the indigenous rulers would be a little weak and they can get in touch with them or control the politics in some way or the other. They also realized that there is a demand of the cotton textile produced in Pulikat in the Spice Island. This realization led them to fetch uh, concession in Teginapatnam in 1608 and 9 and the territory of Ginji and later Pulikat in 1610. So Pulikat was their headquarters since then after which their seat of power moved to Nagapatnam in 1690. So now the Dutch were well settled even compared to the Portuguese. In the north uh, or to achieve Surat as trading center took another very long time. Now the relation of the Portuguese with the Bugals was always very good and it started long back. So uh, the Jesuits as such had a greater role to play in the Mughal court. And it, is it became very difficult for the English or the Dutch to control Surat. A bitter naval war of course uh, headed between the Mughals and the Portuguese in 1604 and this gave the Dutch a bit of an opportunity. The Mughals took the first step by wanting to return their goods uh, which were left in, in 1607 and an invitation reached Masuli Patnam and then a Dutch factory was opened in Surat in 1617. The Dutch policy against the Portuguese was now formulated as destroying the major strongholds controlling the trade routes. The ships were first attacked and later their position in the control land. The Dutch were then in a position to undertake and blockade areas like Goa and Malacca uh, from the sea. In the Spice Island, Abonia was also captured. The Spanish though came to the help of the Portuguese but the strength was much limited. They held their strength till 1633 in the cloth trade and found as we can find from the contemporary records. The cotton textile of Kolobwandel and Surat Coast was still sold by the Portuguese in Indonesia. Let's like, look into the last phase of the Dutch. The Dutch then planned to besiege Goa, conquer Malacca and patrol the Coromandel coast. They also planned to destroy the cinnamon trade of the Portuguese in Ceylon and to bring about an end to the paper factory in the Malabar. In 1636, Goa was blockaded every year for 10 years. Malacca fell in 1641 
and Colombo came to the control of the Dutch in 1655-56 and Cochin in 1659 to 1663. So this whole battle continued in the 17th century, mid 17th century. They then moved on to the coercive measures by which the local rulers had to give all the facilities to the Dutch. They consolidated their position in Molucas and the Indian subcontinent. Now let's move uh, into how the English East India Company uh, operated in this trade. We have to understand uh, that the English East India Company started late. Now English East India Company had e was equally active but had their own financial limitations because it was a company of the traders and not looked after by the crown. The early venture of the English concentrated only on the pepper ports in Indonesia and Spice Island. The English soon realized that the Dutch were much, much more com superior compared to the English in the naval power. Moreover, the home market that they had was too little for profit. The English looking for fresh trading relations in Indian course and to secure second line of trade goods for sale in the eastern islands. This necessity led to the rise of a re-export of trade in Europe and establish of trading posts in Gujarat, the Coromandel coast and eventually in Bengal. In 1607, the third voyage uh, was prepared by Captain Keeling and William Hawkins to Surat and Red Sea for commercial purposes. Now this was how the English actually planned their move. William Hawkins came to uh, about two years later in 1609 and stayed in the court of Jahangir but of course his effort to control Surat was not fulfilled until and unless in 1612 which was the 10th voyage led by Thomas Best secured some political gain from the Mughals at Surat, but it did not save them from any protection from the Portuguese. In the following next three years, England or the English traders actually set their plan and move in India. The English planned to increase their naval strength first and also gain some political edge in the Mughal court where the Jesuits, as we have discussed earlier, were very influential. This would secure them then the market at home and also a market in the east. Earlier with the help of the two Dutchmen, Peter Flores and Luca Athenia, voyages in the coast of Coromandel was conducted in 1610. This further led to the establishment of the English factory in Masulipatnam, which remained one of the key uh, factories of the English uh, uh, trading company. In 10 years, the English then well grasped the essentials about the commercial activities in the Indian Ocean and India's importance in the network. So Thomas Rowe was sent as the official ambassador of King James I, the Mughal court in 1615. The plans were also made to extend commercial ties with Persia. The situation changed with the control of Ormuz in 1612 and this time the Persian forces helped the English traders. So or with Ormuz and Maslipatnam it is very important to understand the Mughals were now taking care of their trading interests in uh, in the in the region in their favor and they will surely become the 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 leaders for the decades to come the portuguese were curtailed off their powers and in 1633 the portuguese in hugli that is a very important port in bengal were taken over by the english it was a chief uh, trading town of the eastern province. The English and the Dutch then turned towards the eastern land of Bengal which was considered as the fruit granary and a very very important textile producing area. The structure of the North European trading companies had certain things in common. 
Its main feature was the head settlement or a factory to be situated at or near some major Indian port, uh, which was considered the, uh, the settlement station in the interior. Many parts for the export of the goods. The stations were independent but maintained in coordination because it was run by companies. We have to understand another key factor in this trading scenario, the French, who had a very small limited role to play but in India, but of course were became, uh, became at one point of time equal competitors of the English. In the 18th century, the Indian foreign mark trade went again for a change from English, French and the Dutch. By the third decade of the century, the French became power uh, to be reckoned with. The English at this time supplanted the Dutch but had reservation for the expanding activities of the French. So the English had to now, after win over, winning over the Dutch power, had to now control the French altogether in a new fashion. In 1644, Cobert formed the Compagnie de Indi Orienta. Uh, only in Thales, uh, which was uh, which also founded a factory in Surat. French sent uh, ambassadors to Mughal court, but of course it was then already in the control of the English, and the French could not make a headway within the Mughal court. A uh, squabble among themselves, that is the French uh, officials, was a common feature. Now this is a problem where the Dutch and the Portuguese also fell, uh, where the, the traders themselves within the company or the officials would squabble. But of course this is one thing that the English could avoid. Initial years were tough of course, in 1674, Pondicherry was acquired from the ruler of Golconda and remained the seat of the French power for a very, very long time. The establishment of the French East India Company by Jean, uh, Jean Law in 1719 increased the French operation. Now, how did the story end? The fortified trading settlements and the naval blockade was the method of operation of all the European companies trading in India. The Indians, sometimes to control the Europeans, would cut their food supply. On the other hand, the Europeans would block the ports and then a settlement would be reached. Now, usually the matter did not uh, take a very ugly course because both the traders had to gain over their trade. Uh, the dispute occurred essentially over the customs dues. Now, this whole problem came to an end for the English with the Farman of 1707 issued by the Mughal Emperor Faruqsir, the, the famous Faruqsir Farman, which gave, uh, which was settled uh, over rupees 3000, where the English were now in an advantageous position over the other companies where they could control the ports. Now let's summarize as to how this whole uh, European trade uh, operated in the Indian Ocean. With the weakness of the central political power, that is the Mughals in North India and the South India powers, in the 18th century the European companies took over not only the trade and commerce but also the politics of the subcontinent. Ultimately, the British took over India in 1857, which became their colony until it, was in, it, it faced its independence in 1947. So uh, an affair which started with a group of traders moved into the control of the area of the trade through European companies and through then uh, it moved into the hand of politics where one nation was being now controlled by the other from, uh, from a, a very larger political schema. So this is how we end the module and thank you for your patience hearing and we can also go back to the text for the detail. Thank you.